Welcome. This lecture on volume calculations will cover four basic methods for determining earth volumes as it relates to surveying and construction. There are four primary methods and one that we see the most is the most visible these days in the 3D CAD realm is the use of the digital terrain model. We also call these digital elevation models or DEM or even a triangulated irregular network. It could be argued that a TIN is not the same as a DTM, but for our discussions here, we can use them nearly interchangeably. Average end areas is a method that is suitable for small projects to large projects and has been used for many years. It can be done readily by hand or by uh, computerized computation methods. Contour areas is a method that is dependent on the use of contours and is suitable for determining volumes of bodies of water. It can also be used for earth volumes as well. And unit areas, also known as grid or borrow pit method, is a method suitable for small sites and lends itself well to hand computations and spreadsheet computations. A triangulated regular network you may recognize is the basis for generation of contours. This triangulated regular network is from a survey in Tennessee. We're looking at it uh, from a bit of an oblique view and arcing across the site from the bottom to the right here is an existing roadway. There's another roadway intersecting it running uphill to the left and as you study this I believe you'll see that this indicates some rolling hilly terrain. This existing tin is the basis for our uh, computations between existing conditions and proposed conditions. Proposed conditions we can generate in a digital terrain model like you see here that is built upon the triangulated regular network for the existing portions that you see shaded in white and it is also built upon cross sections and a profile for the highway that you can see where earth surfaces are shaded in green and pavement surfaces are shaded in orange, yellow, and red. Our 3D design software does a good job of calculating volumes between these 3D surfaces to a much greater level of detail than we can get by simple end areas. Now to illustrate end areas I want to give you a little stockpile example. Perhaps you have seen on subdivision projects in central Illinois one of our first tasks is to strip off our topsoil for reuse later. We'll use scrapers to do this and these uh, scrapers will self-load and self-unload and as they self-unload they'll make a long often elliptical roughly elliptical stockpile like you see here. I've given you a profile view on the bottom and the horizontal lines in that profile represent the contour planes and the vertical spacing on those contour planes is five feet. Here in the middle is a, is a plan view and the outline of each contour plane shows up as a contour line. And at the left is an end view with the contour planes visible. This particular stockpile is 350 feet long from left to right and about 50 feet high on the profile and on the end view. If I want to compute average end areas I need to do a cross-section survey of this stockpile. And if I do so, typically I'll establish a, a baseline and uh, relative to that baseline cut cross-sections. Well, I have established my cross-sections with uh, stationing of 0 plus 0, 0 at the bottom of this figure and at the top of the figure my station is 3 plus 50. At every 50-foot 50 station I have made measurements that help, has helped me draw these simple trapezoids. At the ends, the, the trapezoid is closed, so it is simply a horizontal line and there is no cross-sectional area there. 
the areas you can see are computed here simple trapezoidal shapes and these are the cross-sectional the areas of those tra trapezoidal shapes now the reason we call this average end areas is we will take the average of any pair of adjacent cross sections we'll take the average of those areas and multiply it by the distance between those areas to get a prismoidal volume that prismoidal volume then uh, represents that uh, that portion of the measured volume between those two end areas we add all those prismoidal volumes up and we can get a total for the measured volume in this case we have 40,000 and 96 cubic yards. So again, in more detail, let me show you how this works. From 0 to 50, 0, zero plus zero, 0 to 0 plus 50, I have a distance of 50 feet. At 0 plus 0, 0, I had a end area of 0. At 0 plus 50, it was 1983. The average of those two is 991.5 square feet. The average of the end areas 0 plus 50 and 1 plus 0, 0 is 29.34, and it increases as we get closer to the middle of the stockpile, and then it decreases as we get down to the other end. Well, those end areas are, in this column, averages. I can multiply those averages times the increment distance, that is the 50 feet between each pair of sections, and then get my increment volume in cubic feet and then it sums down to a total again of um, 1,082,600 cubic feet or 40,096 cubic yards. Here I have a series of sections from the project whose digital terrain model I showed you just a few minutes ago and on this particular project some sections have cut and fill your surveying text will guide you through the process that it takes to compute cut and fill volumes simultaneously in cross sections and generate a cumulative total uh, that re will represent whether you have a net cut or fill in any particular reach of the project so here on the left you can see cut on the right you can see fill and as we progress through this project you will see that the balance of cut and fill varies from station to station and that is dictated by the difference between the shape of the proposed earth surface and the existing earth surface back to our stockpile example we can also calculate the volume of the stockpile using contour areas. We, we often use contour areas for calculating the volume of retention ponds or, or lakes that we have done hydrographic surveys on. That makes sense because they tend to be fairly, fairly broad in area and not very deep relatively and thus contours are going to give us a more descriptive view of the irregular shape of those bodies of water. However, I want to illustrate the same process on our stockpile example to give you a comparison. Here on the profile view at the bottom half uh, of the screen you have the five foot contour interval visible and what we're trying to do is compute the area of each contour plane. Each contour plane you can see its edge indicated with the contour lines on the plan view. You can see the smallest contour plane is the one at the top, the largest contour plane is the one at the bottom. And I've measured those areas for you, and you can see them summarized in yellow here. And the volume captured between each pair of contour planes is given on the right, and that sums down. And we have a volume here of 41,467 cubic yards. 
computationally, here's how it goes. You can see my contour elevations at the left, and at every contour elevation, I have a contour area given in square feet. Just like I did in average end area, I'm going to take the average of every adjacent pair of contour areas. So at 760 to 765, the average of those two is 36516.5 square feet. And the vertical distance between those two end areas is 5. So my average end area times my contour interval gives me the increment volume between contour 760 and 765. Now you may have noticed that the volume of this um, of the stockpile now as we measured it with contour areas is greater than it was with uh, cross with uh, cross sections and average end areas. Well think about the um, the number of measurements we have taken here. Here we have uh, we have taken, I believe, ten planes. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven different volumes that we have calculated. Whereas in the in the cross section example or the average end area example, we had seven volumes. So those volumes in the end area example were 50 feet long. These are 5 foot high. So really what we're doing is we're resolving our uh, the accuracy of our survey or of our volume calculation here by using more data inputs. That is more more shapes from which to calculate. The last example I want to uh, describe is known as the unit area example or the grid grid method. Imagine what you have here is a 500 by 500 site that you have taken elevation measurements on a 100 foot by 100 foot grid. So I see my site is shown here in red and this grid is overlaying on the on the irregular surface of the site. At the intersection of every um, pair of lines I have uh, a shot that I have taken. Well, my goal in this case is to calculate the volume below the surface down to uh, a level plane which is going to be the limit of excavation for my project. So, once I have the elevation at every one of my grid points on the ground surface, I can subtract the elevation at my proposed surface. That gives me a depth that I will excavate at every grid point. So I need to summarize those grid point uh, depths on my grid and my grid really becomes the basis for some of my calculation. So at the intersection of every pair of lines, it has a it, it has an alphanumeric designator. For instance, this corner is point A6. This one is B5. This one is E2. This one is F1. And that will be handy for cataloging my data and keeping it keeping it organized. The other important thing about this grid is every square is 100 feet by 100 feet. So my my 100 foot by 100 foot area times the average depth of the volume above that square area will give me my excavation volume. So now I can see my depths at each grid point. This is the depth of the excavation at each grid point. And I can calculate the volume in each square. So here I have organized my data so that in the gray 
you can see, I guess, a representation of my grid lines, and the numbers in the gray represent the depth at each grid point. So I will take the average of 6.9 and 3.6 and 7.9 and 10.6 to get an average depth. I will multiply that average depth by the 100 foot by 100 foot area that those points form the corners of and then get a volume and then that volume in cubic yards turns out to be 2685 cubic yards and I've done that for all of the squares in my grid so once again recapping I'll find the average depth for the corners of the square I'm trying to compute the volume for. Then I'm going to multiply that average depth by the area of the block to find that block volume. I'm going to repeat that for every one of my blocks and then I'm going to sum all the block volumes. So if I'm looking at E1 and F1 and E2 and F2 then the average depth times the area of the block in this case gives me a block volume of 1417 cubic yards and you can see that spelled out here when I have done all that I sum it up and I can come up with 82,000 cubic yards So the four basic, mo four basic methods uh, were digital terrain model, average end areas, contour areas, and unit areas. A digital terrain model requires the use of CAD software. Average end areas, contour areas, and unit areas can all be done by hand computations, and thus they have been around a long time. So are there limitations to these? Absolutely. The digital terrain model uh, certainly cannot be done without CAD, and to be real honest, because of the effort involved, it may not be an appropriate tool for the smallest jobs. It may be possible to generate the volumes you need by hand or with a spreadsheet faster than you could do it with a CAD application. Average end areas can be used from the smallest jobs up to the largest jobs. Uh, even today, using digital terrain models on highway projects especially, we often will prefer to generate our areas with average end areas. And then perhaps use uh, of an integrated volume between two DTMs in, in, odd, in odd areas that don't lend themselves well to average end areas. Contour areas um, can readily be done for small projects and large projects. They can be done by hand and uh, uh, they also lend themselves well to CAD applications because if I can trace the contours in my CAD application or if I already have the contours in my CAD application I can uh, generate the areas very quickly and simply do my computations in a spreadsheet uh, if I don't have 3D software. Unit areas is probably best suited for small projects. Small projects where um, you have control of the site, you can lay out a grid, and uh, this suits itself very, very well to spreadsheet applications. And it gives you an opportunity to do some balancing of cuts and fills. So these are the four methods I uh, recommend that you be familiar with. There are others out there, but these are the ones you can expect to see.